To open our meeting this afternoon, I acknowledge that UBC's campuses are situated within the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh, and of the Sioux Okanagan Nation and their peoples. UBC is a community of learners, and we have much to learn from the indigenous stewards of these lands. As your principal this year, it's my privilege to offer a few uh, comments, uh, update you on what's been going on in the, in the college um, and what's coming up. The fall term has begun with two major events uh, last week and now this, our first general meeting. And what a wonderful gathering it is. And I, I really appreciate all the work that's gone on, the programs committee and our staff to uh, get us all together. And thank you all for coming out. It is a great chance to reconnect with old friends and connect with new friends. Uh, and may we do this often. And I, again, will thank those of you who uh, brought information and your enthusiasm for the various activities uh, represented at the tables at the other end of the room to share with all of us. Um, we cannot, uh, as a co community, the college cannot achieve its goals if we don't have a lot of volunteers. Uh, so I hope you may have found some new way or uh, a way that you can in some small or large way help to keep these activities going. So, uh, the, the two events that we've had already, uh, we had the virtual welcome reception for New Emeriti last week, um, hosted by the president uh, Deborah Buzzard. It was well attended and we had interesting reflections on uh, hopes for retirement from five faculty uh, from this campus and from Okanagan uh, and a nice reflection from one of our uh, not uh, so new Emeriti about what it's actually been like in the first few years. So I think it was a, it was a great uh, welcome for those Emeriti. And then uh, we also had last week the planning retreat. Uh, many of the uh, council, uh, executive, president past, and many involved emeriti were there to uh, look at our strategic plan, uh, confirm that we're on the right, uh, in the, going in the right direction, uh, suggest ways that we could sort of realign our activities. I'm not here. Uh, uh, we're waiting on the report from the facilitator, but um, a few of the things that, that uh, struck me in our discussions from that, uh, next slide please, from that retreat, we have four focus areas in the uh, strategic plan. Um, enriching retirement for Emeriti, uh, Increasing the community profile, the opportunity for Emeriti to give back to uh, communities locally and internationally. Uh, ensuring that we are doing things that make UBC realize that the college is part of UBC and is of value to UBC. And in the center there, ensuring that the college is effective and sustainable uh, in the long run. So I heard that uh, from the retreat that uh, we need to deepen our collaboration with faculty relations on the very successful pre-retirement seminars, uh, maintain and enhance the information that's collated and provided about health and travel insurance, uh, offer an exciting series of engaging and challenging speakers at events such as this GM with opportunities for social connection, uh, supporting initiatives that give Emeriti an opportunity to volunteer and to tackle critical social societal issues. I'll say a bit more about that in a minute. Uh, reviewing our communication strategy and the tools. This is a, uh, an important one that we're putting quite a bit of focus on this year. Expanding knowledge about the Emeritus College across UBC units and their leaders and among individuals nearing retirement. We're hoping to reinvigorate the network of unit reps uh, to be one of the tools in that regard. And developing a succession strategy to encourage more Emeriti to take on 
roles serving on committees, chairing committees, going on council, etc. Uh, those uh, are underpinning our activities. Next slide. So, two important initiatives um, that are ongoing that show how the college can demonstrate that it's um, been part of UBC's initiatives in important ways. And one was the Emeritus Nature and Climate Emergency Cohort. Um, eight or nine of you uh, from a variety of disciplines got together in collaboration with the Peter Wall Institute for Advanced Studies and offered a series of seminars uh, to try to um, bring different ideas, different disciplines together to suggest ways of uh, moving ahead in, in uh, dealing with climate and nature emergency. There is a part two in development uh, with some money from Peter Wall Institute, which is not going to exist uh, anymore in, in its old form, uh, involving a student cohort, which is quite exciting, um, and uh, looking at really policy change that's needed to um, help us understand how to uh, get through the current crises. The, one of the um, statements that they're uh, using as one of the areas of thought uh, came from a recent article in the New York Times by the American Potawatomi scientist Robin Wall Kimmerer, who wrote, we need more than policy change. We need a change in worldview from the fiction of human exceptionalism to the reality of our kinship and reciprocity with the living world. This is going to be one of the ways they're trying to um, work to help UBC adjust away from the concept of sustainability to really looking at underpinnings of the way UBC is um, helping society uh, work on all of our future. The other which is quite uh, exciting is um, ongoing uh, work within the college on reconciliation. And our, our guest speaker this afternoon has certainly been key to that, but others here too. Um, a group of, of Emeriti um, had a, a half day at the Indian Residential School uh, History and Dialogue Center on campus in the spring. Very uh, good on our education to find out more about what that center does, but also how we can reflect on our and UBC's role in colonialism and uh, working towards reconciliation. And I'm very much looking forward to the compilation of resources for further study that's been compiled. Uh, Joanne Archibald uh, said it's going to undergo review by one of the committees before it's released, but it will be a real resource for us individually to help uh, with education in this regard. Just another small step. So, announcements. Um, a few among many. Awards nominations. The, the awards committee was represented here. Uh, last year's recipients uh, are uh, pictured on the wall, but uh, Jim Zittick from the committee uh, mentioned to me that uh, the committee could use more members, but we need all of you to think of colleagues who might be worthy of these awards and get more nominations in. Uh, there are two kinds of awards, and they'd like to have a larger number of nominations to uh, peruse. We get wonderfully uh, accomplished people nominated, but we need to keep that flow of nominations going. Uh, there's a, a new initiative, the member forum. It's going to be a list, list serve for members who sign up. You won't be automatically signed up, don't worry. To share information about anything you might want. It won't be the venue for the college to distribute information about college events, but um, if you have a, a good plumber you could recommend, <laughs> or you need help with something uh, around the house, or you have a question, um, 
Richard Spencer is one of the initiators of this. If you want more information, talk to him today. Uh, that will be coming up. You can uh, email the office and get put on the list. I think it's been announced more than once in the newsletter. Uh, you'll be able to find out more about it. Uh, and the, uh, the subsidies for scholarly activities, reimbursements for expenses. Um, 27 requests were received this year, totaling $65,000. Not quite that amount was eligible for reimbursements, but this is an ongoing support for research that's proving valuable for many of our colleagues. And as you can see, uh, colleagues from across disciplines are taking advantage of this. So please, uh, if you're continuing to do research and need a bit of help for uh, attending a conference, publication costs, etc., this is a way the college can help. And a couple more announcements. Um, the next newsletter is due out uh, in the middle of this month. Uh, watch for elements, uh, visual elements of the new branding that the college is going to be using. Um, and we'll look for feedback on that. And another volunteer opportunity, besides all the ones that you uh, saw today, we're we're going to strike a communications committee to um, help set guidelines um, on the overall strategy for communication. We have in the office uh, Sarah, who does a lot of the communication, putting out the, the newsletters, et cetera, the e-newsletters. We have a newsletter editor who unfortunately couldn't be here today. Um, but. We'd like to be able to provide those people who actually do the work with some guidance as to what's appropriate to go in the newsletter, what kind of information should we be uh, uh, communicating. Uh, if you're interested in that kind of a role on a small committee, then you can talk to me or, or Sandra. And watch for the annual report for last year. It's uh, almost ready. It'll be distributed in the next couple of weeks, I guess. And it, it looks great. <laughs> and looking ahead, a year from now, we'll have new dedicated space in a building that's under construction right now. Now, I know that when I come back to campus, which isn't too often, things look different every time. If you're not familiar with this space, this is where the uh, extension of Brock Hall used to be. If that can, you can picture that in your mind. I know many of you didn't work on campus, so that maybe doesn't uh, locate you. But it's it's a, an interesting part of campus. There's uh, the the law building is here. The arts undergraduate student is this black, whatever spaceship. There's a new residence tower here. Uh, gauge towers are here. The old ones. There's all sorts of residence space. This is the new building. We'll have space in this lower part of the building, around the uh, south side of the building. It's not going to be space for a meeting like this, but it will have space for Sandra and the other staff, um, for the principal if they pop in there. It'll have small meeting room and a couple of uh, places for people to sit around and chat. So it is going to be useful. It'll be a place on campus for Emeriti to connect. And we're very much looking forward to this. Uh, it, it should be, we should be occupying it a year from now, if not before. That's it. Okay, that's actually the end of my slide, the end of my comments. Again, I welcome you, very much appreciate your attendance and your participation. Looking forward to a great year. And now I'll ask Sandra Bressler, who's been leading our programs committee to take over. Thank you, Paul. So today I have the pleasure of introducing to you, and I don't think she needs introduction, to uh, Joanne Archibald Kong Kong Wiam who will share her personal and professional experiences in Indigenous education from early learning to graduate education. 
She is a member of the Stalo First Nations and has kinship in the Statlium First Nations in British Columbia. Over a 45-year educational career, she has served as a school teacher, curriculum developer, researcher, author, university leader, and profession, professor. She is Professor Emeritus in the UBC Department of Educational Studies. And at UBC, she has held the leadership positions of Director of First Nations House of Learning, Associate Dean for Indigenous Education, and the Director of UBC's Indigenous Teacher Education Program. In 2018, Kwam was appointed an Officer of the Order of Canada for her lifelong contribution to advancing Indigenous education in kindergarten to grade 12 and post-secondary education through policy, programs, curricula, and research. Joanne. Ace Wael. I'm just uh, uh, trying out my little uh, electronic talking stick, even though you can't see it. It's in my my hip pocket. So I think you can all hear me. Yes? Yes? Great. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra, for that lovely introduction. And I am um, very honored to be asked to share some of my perspectives and experiences in relation to Indigenous education. I um, want to uh, begin by also acknowledging one of the indigenous nations on whose unceded ancestral lands we uh, are situated on. I want to highlight the Musqueam uh, people, the people of the river grass. And this picture you know, shows uh, somewhat of the Fraser River, but you see the grass, uh, the Musqueam, the name Musqueam comes from a particular kind of grass that grows by the river. And the Musqueam are very much uh, intertwined, the cultural identity and life ways, very much uh, interrelated with the environment, the river grass, the river, the resources of the river. And for those of you who want to know more about Musqueam, you can visit their website. and. Uh, there are videos that have community people talking about their history, their culture, some of the issues and um, initiatives that they are involved in. So I invite you to learn more about the Musqueam on whose unceded lands we uh, learn and study on today. I want to also share an Indigenous teaching that Simlano, Vince Stogan of Musqueam, one of our dear elders who's now passed on, but he guided us here at UBC and elsewhere for many years, helping to make us think about the indigenous teachings, the knowledge, the values that have guided many of our indigenous peoples over the years and that today we are fortunate that we still have some of those teachings and, those, and especially the values to guide us. He taught us to be together, to create an environment that was safe, that was welcoming, that was comfortable, and that nudged us in ways to be the best that we could be to ourselves, to each other, to the environment, and to find ways that we can learn from and share with each other. So I want to start with this particular teaching. And I'm a teacher at heart. That's how I started out my university career. I was a primary school teacher at one time. And with this teaching, I'll ask for a little bit of participation from you in a way that 
is comfortable to you. Now, normally in the, the gatherings before COVID, we would join hands in ways. But today, instead of joining hands, you'll have a choice. So when we gather together in a great big circle, and now you could use your imagination for this purpose, think that we're in this great big circle. And Vince would say, my dear ones, I would like you to join me in this teaching. And he would say, if we take our left hand, we can have our palm facing upwards. And he said, this symbolizes that we reach back, that we ask for, that we receive the teachings of those who have walked before us. And then he said, we have this important responsibility that we, we, when we learn the teachings, we then put them into our everyday lives. That's in the sense of that transformation of, of, of uh, the past into the present, into whatever context we find ourselves. And then he said, we have a responsibility to pass this knowledge, this teachings to guide others. And we symbolize that by taking our right hand with our palm facing downwards as if we are giving. So with our left hand, we receive walk, we put it into our everyday life, then, then we pass it on, we give it to others. Now, normally when we would do this, we would join hands so that we would connect. But I won't ask you to do that today. But I think if you want to kind of just use your elbows on one to connect with somebody beside you on the other, so at least you have a safe little connection with each other that way. So. So that was Simlano's teaching. And this way, he always said, you know, find a way to get people comfortable um, so they can have a smile, they could have a little laugh, and to have a little fun in learning. So those, that was important. And this notion of hands back, hands forward, really has guided my work in, in Indigenous education, where I have looked to those leaders and the elders who have walked before me to, to watch, to learn from how they have been able to maintain their indigenous ways of knowing and being, and to put those into all areas of education, from early learning, kindergarten to grade 12, and post-secondary, and community learning as well. And I also look back to some of our traditional uh, indigenous stories. We might call those uh, swakwiam uh, in my Halkamilam language. That means it's, a, it's an old story. It's, it's, it's from tradition. But this story today that I will share with you was told by Elder Vi Hilbert of the Upper Skagit people. And uh, she lived um, around um, the, the Seattle uh, area at one time. And she told this story, which if we have a name for it, it could be called Lady Laos Cleans Her House. Now, in a number of our indigenous stories, sometimes uh, a small what we might think of an insignificant creature can become a teacher for us. So I want you to have a, a little fun with your imaginations right now to, to um, just listen and, and have a, a time for you to imagine this story. That there's this tiny little character named Lady Laos. And Lady Laos lives in this great big longhouse. And you see a picture. I think this is the longhouse here at UBC. But just imagine this little creature walks into this great big longhouse. And she looks around. And as she does that, 
she has sadness in her heart because she sees that that longhouse has not been looked after for many years. Lots of uh, garbage and the dust all over the place. And she remembers long ago, people would come to this longhouse. They would gather, they would share their songs, their dances, they would tell stories, they would tell about their cultural laws and their kinship, and they would eat food and they would exchange gifts. And in that way, they had a good sense of family and community, and they had a way to carry on their culture. But that hasn't happened in this longhouse for a long time. And Lady Louse thinks, hmm, I think I need to do something. And she thinks and she wonders, what could she do? And her idea is to clean up the longhouse. So she goes and finds her tiny little cedar broom and she goes to one end of the longhouse where there are some wooden benches and she takes her little cedar broom and she sweeps and sweeps and goes back and forth and there's so much dust that the dust starts to rise. And little lady louse thinks of all the work she's got to do and so she sweeps harder and she goes back and forth and back and forth until she's at the middle of that big longhouse and there's so much dust. Lady Louse gets lost. That was Vi's story. And often with some of the indigenous stories, they stop abruptly. And you may be thinking, is that all there is to that story? What happened? When that story ends or stops, doesn't mean it's the total ending of the story, but it's an invitation for you who are listening to start to engage with the story, to start to learn from that story. When I first heard it, you know, I thought that little lady louse reminded me of being a UBC faculty or administrator, thinking, <clears throat> oh, there's so much to do. Got to change this great big institution to be more friendly, to be more responsive to Indigenous students, Indigenous ways of knowing, what am I going to do? And by doing the, the, all the work, sometimes I felt myself as quam quam quiam, I lost myself sometimes, or perhaps I lost my vision, my direction. And that's how I identified at first with that little lady louse. Then I heard someone else who heard that story say, hmm, you know, that dust kind of reminds me about our colonial laws that, at, at, that um, ensured that indigenous language, culture, you know, it was outlawed. We could not practice it. And all forms of other colonial policies and practices where a sense of indigenous culture, sometimes we say may have been lost, but really it was forbidden, it was taken away. And that's how I think some people have um, felt about that dust and the impact of that dust. And then somebody else once shared, well, sometimes if you're still for a while, eventually that dust will settle. Then you have another opportunity to see, to be, to do in the world. And then we wonder, what will li little lady Laos do next, given another chance? Well, we, we could return to that story um, throughout this presentation. But I want to share a little bit further about my own personal story of education. I grew up on a, in a small reserve community called Suwali. 
which the name of that means to kind of go around the bend. There's a lovely little creek that runs through our reserve. And I had, I, I believe, um, a wonderful childhood, actually, where I had the freedom to play in the fields, in the forest, by the creek with my cousins. And that was an important time. Then I remember starting to go to public school at the time. And I always felt that when I started public school from then grade one, there was no kindergarten then, uh, going up to grade 12, it was as if I stepped into a different world when I got on, when I, I got onto the school bus and went to the school. It was different. It was not home. There was nothing in my learning throughout, throughout school that would make me feel proud to be Indigenous, proud to be Stalo. There was nothing like that. When I got to high school, there was a little bit maybe in um, social studies, but the, it, you know, the, uh, um, the history presented was stereotypical of Indigenous peoples. There were, was nothing about the contribution of Indigenous peoples. So I never felt like I identified with the indigenous peoples that we studied, even a little bit. And probably I was glad there wasn't a lot of that same thing. And then when I think of my graduation, I graduated and there was one other Stalo person who graduated with me and all my other cousins whom I grew up with and friends, they, they, they didn't make it to grade 12. And when I started learning about the, the um, history of uh, Indigenous education, I realized in my university studies that when I finished high school, I was um, of the 6% of the Indigenous students who started high school, I was of the 6% who completed. All the rest did not. And, you know, when we, um, that was Harry Hawthorne's report, 1966-67. And, you know, I, I wondered, uh, how did that happen? Because growing up, I participated then in some of our cultural ceremonies. I was lucky to have some of my grandparents live next to me. And we had a good sense of family and community, even though there were social issues and, and that on the uh, reserve community. But it wasn't until I started learning at university some of the, the history then, you might say, of, uh, of Indigenous peoples in BC and across Canada that I started to learn about some of the colonial laws and rules, which I will speak about. Now, I call this uh, slide from regulation to hopeless reality in the way that there, and I use some of these examples of uh, uh, the law, the Indian Act, uh, which was uh, 1876 until today you know, has really um, imposed uh, ways of, 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 of life on First Nations people all this time. That, and I didn't know this when I was growing up as a, a child. Um, and I didn't know about what was called the potlatch ban, where Indigenous people were not allowed to gather for uh, potlatches, for feasts, for namings. And these were really important times where family, community would come together, where they would have that sense of kinship. They would pass on cultural teachings. 
uh, the language. You know, so when I, um, as I was growing up, I did not learn my indigenous language, Halkamelem, because it was forbidden uh, to be uh, taught, to be spoken. And um, I also felt that you know, some of the cultural traditions and teachings, even though they were practiced, you know, I, I, I wondered sometimes, um, you know, how some of the indigenous people could remember and speak the language, how they could remember how to do the ceremonies. And then I started to gain a greater appreciation of that resistance and resilience of indigenous people to some of these colonial laws. We have heard a lot about Indian residential schools uh, that I won't say uh, more about at this time, uh, except that I recognize my uh, mother went to the Kamloops Indian Residential School, and my grandparents uh, of the four, three of them went to residential school. And in uh, my uh, dad's uh, fam in his with his brothers, some of them went to residential school. He went to public school. And, and so it was, it was rather mixed, but I have uh, um, since recognized the impact of that residential school where, you know, children were taken away from their families from the age of five, six, until they're 16, you know, for the school year. And we have to really then appreciate what that does to the family, to an individual, to a family, to a community, when your children, you know, the heart of your, uh, your, your family, when they're taken away, when they're separated, when they experience the various abuse that we have heard about, you know, where they have not had the opportunity to learn their culture, to have a strong identity as an indigenous person. We have to really then appreciate that impact. And perhaps for some of us, it gives us purpose to change, to ensure that we can have education, especially, you know, that promotes uh, and facilitates inclusion, where a child, an indigenous child, feels safe and comfortable, has the opportunity to learn about their indigenous ways, for non-indigenous students to also have the same opportunity. Um, so I think that the impact of these particular laws and policies, you know, has, has, um, has pr provided many of us an opportunity to kind of stand up and move forward, to take that learning, to know the past, the colonial past, to think about in our everyday lives, how might we change some of that? How might you know, those perspectives about indigenous people that were perpetuated in stereotypical learning curriculum, how do we change that? Or how, how has, has that kind of knowledge impacted how I think about indigenous people today? I just want to mention briefly about the 60s and millennial scoop where this continued um, uh, process of taking children away from their family and their community has persisted. And I, I, I um, share this with you to help us think about that impact, thinking about the generations of children who have experienced, you know, this uh, separation, denial of you know, uh, culture, of family, of community. But we also realize that there are some people who were able to resist, who maybe 
didn't get lost so much in that colonial dust, that they were able to keep you know, their indigenous ways of knowing, their culture, their language, their values. Our, our elders that, with whom I learned have said, you know, they put a lot of that knowledge to sleep because they couldn't practice it. But there came a time when it was time to reawaken, to bring out the knowledges. And it was many of these dear elders shown on this slide where I am from, the Stalo, who started a cultural revitalization movement of language, of the Stalo uh, culture, and helped to guide the development of school curriculum so that all children in the Stalo area, uh, the Fraser Valley area, all children who attended public school also had the opportunity to learn about Stalo people, about the importance of the river, uh, the, the land, the stories that connect to the land, the stories that uh, taught us about the kinship to nature. You know, that if we have this kinship to this particular mountain, we feel like we are part, that that mountain is a part of who we are, it's a part of our family, then we have to think about how do we treat members of our family? You know, I think today that helps us think about, you know, uh, the changing perspective we might need uh, in thinking about how we deal with climate change and emergency. If we go back to those stories that helped us to be better human beings, to the land, to the more than humans, to ourselves. Those stories can guide us. They can keep encouraging us when maybe we get lost in that dust and lose our way. But we have the stories and we have each other to help guide us. For those elders, um, they helped me when I was doing my doctoral studies long ago uh, to think about how we learn to work with these stories, how we can uh, uh, ensure that we can draw on these stories for educational purposes. And so they helped me create this Indigenous story work framework that has these seven principles that are shown respect, responsibility, oops, reverence, reciprocity, holism, interrelatedness, and synergy. If you really want to know more about this, you can visit my website um, and about these principles. But I have been able to, um, when the hands back, hands forward, I've learned um, how stories can be a certain type of pedagogy they can help with the methodology. And I've worked with uh, graduate students and teachers so that they can take these different uh, ideas, learn about them, then find a way to put them into their everyday teaching practice. And then uh, ensure that the students uh, that they are teaching also have that opportunity. I want to move on to what we might um, uh, here call uh, Indigenous-led policy and law. So previously, I listed those what, that were imposed on Indigenous people. So in response, Indigenous people in Canada you know, um, found ways to um, resist to respond to these uh, colonial uh, processes. And I, the first one noted here, the Indian control of Indian education, 1972, you know, was an important uh, milestone where Indigenous peoples across the country in their own regional ways responded to the federal government's, um, it was then called the 1969 White Paper, which was really meant to really assimilate Indigenous peoples 
into Canadian society to kind of finish what would, they had hoped would have happened um, and to deny the, the, the rights of Indigenous peoples in, in reality. Um, but Indigenous people uh, got together and they created their own response and in education this was one response where the policies of um, parental responsibility and local control were important. And you think, isn't that what we want, parent responsibility in good ways? Um, and that we want to have local control. What, when we see schools are involved in what they're doing, they want to have, well, maybe, they need to have parents involved and in supporting what's happening in the school. Uh, the school districts, of course, have local control over some aspects of how they offer education. But this policy went further to really uh, suggest that in Indigenous culture should be embedded in learning and that we needed to have Indigenous teachers. We needed to have better educational facilities uh, better schools. So that was important uh, policy that started to make, I think, many changes in education. And the, um, I won't go into all of these here, um, just because of time, but maybe uh, to talk a little bit more about um, you, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Uh, and this um, declaration came into being through the United Nations 2007. Canada signed on, not until 2010. And then in 2019, the provincial government of BC uh, made uh, this declaration based on human rights, based you know, on ensuring uh, that Indigenous people's right to culture, language, to having control over aspects of their own life, that that could be uh, carried out. And so BC made this into a law 2019, and Canada as a federal government put this into an act in 2021. So there has been, I think, some implications now across the country and in BC, you know, where in, ed in education, you know, we take a look at how aspects of learning can ensure, can address human rights of indigenous peoples. Um, and the other uh, policy uh, is related to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada with its 94 calls to action, which I think has made a, an important um, uh, start for making a systemic change in education um, at all levels with, uh, I think, this uh, TRC, Truth and Reconciliation Commission. What was important was that the truth was shared of Indigenous peoples who attended residential schools and the truth of the impact of those schools and the truth of the impact on generations of Indigenous people. You know, that emerged. And if you want to know more, you can read some of the TRC reports. There are many resources now where Indigenous people are sharing their lived stories. And I think it's important in reading these stories to also recognize that resistance and resilience that indigenous people, you know, have, have, have been able to, to, um, to, to uh, recognize and to share with others. Um, the, um, the other impact of the, the TRC in education, you know, is that um, we, we now have uh, in K-12 the, um, the regulation 
you know, in, in BC, that all grade levels and in all subject areas, that indigenous perspectives, ways of knowing are included now, that teachers must address indigeneity in some way from grade one through to grade 12. And that began 2016, it started, and by 2019, there was full implementation in the uh, complete uh, schooling level. So perhaps those of you with now any grandchildren, great-grandchildren, other you know, relatives of your families attending K-12, be good for you to ask them, hey, what are you learning about indigenous people in your school? You know, what's, um, what do you think about that? And it's taken a lot of work of a lot of people over many years to get to this point. You know, when, um, when I shared my experience of going to public school, you know, where for me, it was like being in a different world. It wasn't familiar. It wa I wasn't. I didn't feel that it was a familiar place of family or community. You know, it was very separate. Whatever I did in school was so separate for, from what I did at home, with my community on the weekends and the summers, uh, in the, you know, evenings. Uh, but for some reason, I was able to persist. I was able to learn. And I think through that experience, though, it provided me that um, uh, drive to do something differently so that I could create a better learning environment in some way for Indigenous kids and for non-Indigenous kids to also learn something. Back to hands back hands forward. Okay, and now I want to move along a little bit to the UBC story because I spent 36 years <laughs> here at UBC in my uh, professional career uh, as um, I've been a sessional lecturer, an instructor, got into the professorial ranks, and then also um, uh, took on directorships. Uh, that, that was noted in my introduction. So with, with this experience, I, I want to highlight you know, some of the important uh, changes that have taken place within UBC, and, and also talk about what has been important uh, in making these changes. So you see on here there are different logos of some of the uh, parts of the um, logos of some of the Indigenous uh, programs here at UBC, uh, some of which I will uh, talk about. Here's the First Nations Longhouse. Now, Let's get a sense. How many of you have been in the First Nations Longhouse? Raise your hands high. Let's see. How many of you? Okay, great. So those of you who have been inside, you know when you walk in how magnificent it is? Where you have those house posts, the smell of the cedar, you know, and that building is thought of as a home away from home for the students who come to study here at UBC, for faculty who are here to have a place where you can feel you know, uh, welcome, where you have a place to learn, and where indigeneity is the foundation. When you think of that longhouse, the structure itself, it is a traditional structure, the longhouse in a contemporary setting, of course. And the artwork of the house posts guide the teachings that happen there. Now, the longhouse 
is celebrating its 30th anniversary this year. So 30 years ago, that longhouse opened, 1993. And before that, we had the First Nations House of Learning as a unit um, at UBC that um, was created uh, by Verna Kirkness and the late Tom Berger. But they um, consulted with others. They wrote a report that they submitted to the president of the time saying that we needed, there needed to be a, a unit called the First Nations House of Learning that would be there to, to ensure that the resources of the university were accessible to indigenous students and communities. And that there was opportunity then for uh, a way to increase the numbers of indigenous uh, students attending UBC. And um, eventually there, there was interest uh, uh, sorry, when the House of Learning began, they undertook community consultations within BC with Indigenous community members and leaders to ask, what can UBC do to make, to respond to the needs you have in your community? So there were certain areas of study that they had recommended and others had also recommended we need to have a place like a longhouse on the campus. So that was important to have that direction. And then the House of Learning group worked on this. And when we thought of the longhouse, we always felt that's a dream. Don't think we'll ever get there, but it's lovely to think we'd have one. But it took and, you know, of uh, the president of the time, um, David Strangway, you know, and uh, Verna and other indigenous elders and leaders and funders and also provincial government of the time, which that was NDP. <laughs> um, but they provided uh, support, funding, work together for us to get this longhouse. And this longhouse then is this home away from home. And I think that when it was established, it provided, you know, then people could see the longhouse. <laughs> it made more visible. Indigeneity became somewhat more visible. But then coming into the longhouse, you know, you have those of you who have been there, been there for university occasions, perhaps some cultural occasions, to learn from one another, to connect, just like we're doing here. And students then could w come. And now the Longhouse has um, all, of, all of the area, really, um, the, the parts of the Longhouse are for student activities and for um, sharing. Uh, there are conferences. Um, there we have, uh, there's the Weehua Library, which is uh, beside the Longhouse, and it has collect an indigenous um, collection and is, uh, has, is the first um, university branch library um, at universities in Canada. And um, maybe before I go into this, you know, with, with UBC, um, it, this, I will, NITEP, the acronym, stands for Native Indian Teacher Education Program. That was established in 1974. Okay, today, you know, we, the, NITEP is called UBC's Indigenous Teacher Education Program, uh, but it still has the name NITEP because NITEP has become a name more than an acronym. Because people who have been in NITEP, who come from the indigenous communities, have felt NITEP is like an extended family for them, that it's a cohort model. 
they have learned also about indigenous education and ways to teach indigenous education. They have also learned everything else they need to become a teacher. And so this NITEP started in 1974, the first indigenous program here at UBC. 1975 was that what we have now, First Nations Legal Studies. And these two programs have continued and, got, and become stronger. NITEP celebrates its 50 years uh, next year. And I think this is important comparison in a way when you think of what was there in 1974, one program. I don't know at that time we did not have, uh, not sure if we had an indigenous faculty member, at least not a self-identified indigenous faculty member. But now today when we think of almost 50 years later here at UBC, we have so much more. You know, and I want to acknowledge some of the folks who are here today who have helped create some of the, the programs uh, and uh, services that um, we have today. Now I see Sid Katz, Bridge Through Sport, uh, uh, connection with the Musqueam community, uh, Marjorie Fee, uh, Marjorie and I helped develop the, f the, the first two Indigenous Studies courses. You remember that, Marjorie? <laughs> we drafted those courses so that the Indigenous Studies program could begin. And of course, Marjorie has done much more after that. Um, we have uh, John Claxton, uh, my partner now, um, but John helped get the Chinook business program going, which is quite an extensive program with community education, with bringing together different business schools in the province. Imagine different business schools working together. <laughs> um, there, you know, Richard Bidan um, was the third director of the First Nations House of Learning, and of course a, a, a key faculty member in uh, social work. And, um, and of course, uh, Paul Harrison and Richard Spencer, you were really important at those policy uh, student services registrar tables when we needed to have an ally speak up, you know, for uh, indigeneity. And then I also appreciate my colleagues in Ed Studies, you know, where we had there, the Tiskel uh, program, which is a, a specialization in indigenous graduate studies, but Ed Studies, I believe, has, has been a, a, a leader within our faculty of education and elsewhere uh, with indigenous programming. And I see Don Fisher, uh, Dan Pratt, uh, Richard, Bo uh, <laughs> Roger Boshe, sorry, uh, Kogila Adam Moodley here. I hope I haven't missed anyone of my department, but it is good that, you know, here we have the supports, those who are working together with us. So, you know, that, that um, the little lady Louse reached out and made sure that she didn't work alone because it takes many hands, many hearts working together to make the kind of changes that we have today. Um, oh, I'm supposed to be, sorry, I'm supposed to be finished, Deborah. so I'm going to, <laughs> go, uh, to go through um, here that NITEP today. You know, I, I think NITEP has, has been through many different um, experiences as a program, has helped develop admission policies, uh, student support policies, has changed, you know, the system you might say, of teacher education so that we can have the success that we have today. Um, I will, won't talk so much about graduate area and where, you know, 
this idea of from regulation to hopeful reality. Earlier I spoke a bit about the changes happening in the K-12 education uh, system where we um, now have much more that we can learn about indigeneity in schooling. And that the work happening, I think, today is focusing a lot on teachers to help teachers then feel comfortable including Indigenous perspectives within their teaching approaches, that they should not be doing this work alone, that there are people in the school districts, in our universities, who could provide that mentorship, who could provide opportunities to share what, the, what they're experiencing, share the resources. So I believe now we have much more hope in K-12 and that importantly that we provide that mentorship. And here are some of the, um, might say, lessons that I have learned about making this kind of systemic change that we need to ensure that we always have indigenous engagement and leadership and, and um, you know, where the colonial past we didn't, but now we do. And that all work together. So that means non-indigenous allies, supporters working with us because we you know, need to have lots of different people contributing their strengths their ideas, their questions, and that we look at holistic change. It's not just a program, not just a course. It's those, it's people, it's policies that need to change, it's the facilities, um, and that when we do this, we can share our experiences and resources as a way to you know, keep moving with the hands forward with others. I want to just um, highlight returning to that Sardis, my experience. I went to the Sardis secondary school, and I mentioned, uh, you know, um, th there were two of us who graduated that year. Now, looking at this school now, you see on their website, they have here that learning must be engaging and relevant, that they also include first people's principles of learning, which has become an important framework for the Ministry of Education in BC. You know, that um, they're here, one heart, one mind, working together for a common purpose based on the Halkamilam language or teaching, which is vastly different you know, I think, well, 50 years is a long time, <laughs> but I would hope that, you know, we see these, I think, more substantial changes have happened. So um, I want to just end with a, a few, uh, a couple of minutes, and I know we're running sh uh, late, but I want to show this video to um, highlight that we have, stu here are students, indigenous, mainly Stalo students who wrote a song. They worked with a uh, uh, a group. The, the students thought about their message and they sang it and they produced the music. So here's their voice and their message I want to end with. Yeah.
hot. It takes time with life's being bad. Cause What can I say? <laughs> this was such a wonderful, wonderful presentation. Presentation. The hands back, hands forward concept that you weave throughout your whole talk was just beautiful. The example of the story and then sharing your own story, sharing so much information about indigenous reality, about excuse me, about Indigenous-led policy and also the impact on individuals and families in all this. It was just really, really enlightening. And then your story <laughs> and your story at UBC, which also is something that spanned really many, many years and many, many achievements to be proud of. I just want to share what you said about the importance of different people participating in Indigenous change and how important that is. And also your beautiful ending. What a beautiful song. So on behalf of everybody here, I'd like to thank you for your presentation today. We have a small token of appreciation for our speaker. <laughs> And it's very, yes. it's very appropriate for today. Yes, thank Enjoy. you. <laughs> okay, now, we do have a few minutes for questions. So is there anyone, um, I know it's two o'clock, it's just after two, but if you can stay a little longer and you have some questions that you'd like to share, please do. Anybody? Oh, sure. Thank you, Joanne. Uh, I wonder if you can, uh, I hope, give me a hopeful answer to this question. The changes that have happened in the, the public school system in BC, do you feel that the teachers, not necessarily the new graduates from UBC, but teachers who've been in the system for a while, are they getting good resources and training to implement the, the changes of the curriculum effectively? Yeah, sure. I, well, I think it, of course, varies. The, um, you know, school districts really have the uh, prime responsibility in a sense for professional development. And each school district has um, people in the roles of a, principle of indigenous education. Some have other uh, roles such as providing uh, teaching support, teaching enhancement. You know, there are sometimes student support workers too. So in some districts, they have a great team that then works with teachers and also works with other district leaders like numeracy. I didn't mention this in in my talk, but the, um, there are some schools that have worked together, have brought together indigenous educators and numeracy educators, and developing, through that, developing a culturally responsive approach to teaching mathematics. And that group has also worked with a community group, Dogwood 25 being one of them, the faculties, UBC Faculty of Education. And so with that, there's, there's this opportunity to create a network. So there is broadly a provincial network, you know, where there's an annual symposium. Teachers share their approaches. They get together like this and, well, in person and, and then Zoom during COVID. But that idea of sharing resources and posting them on a website, you know, and I find that the, the districts, I'm more hopeful about what they um, 
because they have hired people in those roles to provide leadership and mentorship. And there is the expectation that teachers need to address indigeneity now. And then I find teachers, many are receptive. There are still those who are afraid to do something because they don't want to offend or they, they feel uncomfortable. But then there are those who can help people who have that hesitation. And that, so I am more hopeful about what's happening in uh, districts um, for those teachers who have been out practicing for a while. We'll bring you the mic. Has there been any move to incorporate into K-12 to um, Indigenous-led healing facilitators from the community reaching out to the schools? Yeah. You know, I think that uh, perhaps in some districts, um, you know, th there are community um, elders, uh, cultural knowledge holders, who then uh, provide that mentorship to both teachers and students. And, you know, really the, the other way of thinking about that is that if teachers learn to um, go outside into the environment, even if they're in an urban environment, there are parks, we have the beach, there are areas, and they can learn that being in nature also is a way to um, soothe emotions or help rejuvenate in ways so we can... Uh, in, in the network that I talked about, we often have teachers in the environment and in nature learning how to be with nature. That is a, a holistic way of learning. You can learn about math, but you also learn about yourself as an individual and deal with you know, heart, mind, body, and spirit. So yes, yeah, some of that is happening, um, but I don't know on, on what kind of wide scale. Any last question? Okay. Um, I'm going to need Sandra. We have technology here. Yes, okay, last, last question. Don't have to do this. Oh, there's your mic coming up. So, Joanne, this is not a question, <laughs> but a comment. And my comment is, you are such an amazing example of an elder. Oh. Mm -hmm. I'm moved. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I try Beautiful. to encourage Western elders to uh, uh, accept a role. And I see the way you have pointed back and left us at the end with that amazing song. And I just want to say how much it's touched my heart thank you. and thank you. Yeah, thank you and ask all of us to think about the role of indigenous elders and what we can learn mm -hmm. yes. thank you thank you thank you joanne don't forget this you'll see um a, a upcoming events on the slide just take a quick look at that i know time's short but also to tell you about our next meeting, uh, the title, which is, Are Humans Obsolete in the Age of Artificial Intelligence? I think that you'll find that a very interesting talk. So that's Wednesday, November 22nd, and it is in person. This is our first in-person general meeting since COVID, and I am so appreciative of all the people that came today, and we look forward to seeing you on the 22nd. Thank you all for coming. <clears throat>